The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Perhaps summer has given you some time to reflect on big, deep questions. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight on The Agenda in the Summer, some food for thought about poetry and time travel. Poetry doesn't pay the bills for most poets. It's a labor of love. For Brian Wood, that means in addition to his third collection of poetry, he's also got a fascinating day job. The new book is called Zen in Beverly Hills, and he joins us now on that and his other talents. It's really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I really enjoy the book. It's Thanks. a small but mighty book. <laughs> um, you know, by day, you're a literary agent representing nonfiction sports writers. Mm -hmm. By night, or maybe on the weekend, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. you're a poet. Uh, how do you balance the difference between those two worlds? Uh, that's a, uh, to be honest, um, the poetry is kind of an escape. Not that my job is, I'm not a brain surgeon or anything like that. I realize people have difficult jobs, mm -hmm. but uh, being an agent can be difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the poetry is just kind of an escape uh, to things I want to work on. And um, yeah, it's a way to uh, articulate some things I otherwise wouldn't be able to articulate. Well, I was going to ask you that because, I mean, working in sports, I'm a big basketball fan, mm -hmm. and there are some plays, it's like, ooh, that is poetry in mm -hmm. motion, right? Mm -hmm. um, but poetry, I think, digs deeper. Um, what is it about poetry that allows you to express yourself? I think it's a way of saying things you couldn't say any other way. Uh, you know, movie makers like Scorsese or Orson Welles or... Uh, Great music makers like Mozart or Bach, they have their own art form. I think poetry at its best says things concisely that would be impossible to tell in a, in a play, a book, or a novel, however well written. However well written. Um, when a poem does its job well, it says things you've thought, but never uh, seen put that way. If you were to pick something, uh, a time in your life where you were having challenges um, and poetry allowed you to get at the heart of why you were feeling the way you were feeling, what moment would you say that was? Um, I know this will sound weird, but it, it kind of hit me when you, we were discussing a bit before we came on camera, um, the, one, the one about um, our dog dying. That would be a good indication of that. Uh, when a dog dies, it's, it hits you in ways it's hard to conceive of. And uh, working on that poem helped me deal with what I was dealing with. It, it didn't cure it by any means, but lamenting her loss in a poem helped me deal with the fact that she was no longer here. Um, by the way, a great poem and my condolences. Well, thank you. Uh, would you literally, because uh, I think a lot of times when people think uh, you're an agent, um, how many agents actually write their own books. Is that something that occurs a lot? I don't think so, no. They mainly keep to themselves. <laughs> I, I do know a couple uh, years ago, a couple editors at HarperCollins wrote a book called Thinking Like Your Editor, you know, to help authors uh, try to break into the business. Mm -hmm. By coincidence, they're both agents themselves now. Mm -hmm. So whether they'll follow up or not <laughs> and do Thinking Like Your Agent is another question. But as far as I know, uh, being an agent cures most people. Uh, uh, for being an agent, I think, um, takes away the mystery of the industry. So I don't think... What do you mean by that? Oh, sure. Well, you would know why. You've been in television a long time. When yeah. you're a kid, television is wonderful and perfect and great, and you love every show and you can't wait. And then you go into the industry and realize it's a long climb up, and sometimes you have to climb down. And in every industry has its secrets. And the book... And like when, I'm sure when you were a kid, you loved to read, and I did too, and you just devoured them. And now you find out that the blurbs in the back aren't necessarily blurbs. Yeah, there's a bigger Sometimes story. manufactured. And in nonfiction, the book is often written by somebody else. And I'm ghost, sure that happens in fiction. Writers, right? Oh, yes. And I'm sure that happens in fiction, too. But that side, I'm, I'm blissfully unaware of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's happened before when I've read a book and I thought it was the writer and then find out that they didn't write it. And it felt kind of like you were duped in a way. I, I shouldn't tell the story. I know later. you're telling you all the industry secrets. You can always take secrets. it out later. But what, a lot of the top editors I deal with are very good at their jobs. And mm -hmm. it's a joke sometimes that to start the conversation, I'll say, so what book are you rewriting from scratch today? Oh, no. And instead of laughing, there's this awkward, <laughs> thanks, Brian. <laughs> and then they either answer me or they go on with what they want to talk about. But you a nonfiction, a, non a lot of the books uh, sometimes have been written from scratch by someone else. You know that emoji? There's an emoji that has a smile but a tear down their face because I'm just like, oh, gosh, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who want to break into the industry and put their blood, sweat, and tears, and then they don't, but then... 
behind the scenes. Maybe you'll write a book about that. Oh, I'd probably kill, <laughs> but sure. <laughs> well, your first book, Winter Walk, was published in 2013. Mm -hmm. What motivated you to begin writing poetry? I, I had been doing them for a while. I didn't really write anything decent until I was in my mid-30s. Until then, I was just parodying much better poets and showing them to my friends. Uh, as I got older and a little more mature, uh, they started getting a little better, and friends started encouraging me to uh, publish. And with my girlfriend's help, it took me a while, but I submitted to a few smaller presses. And eventually, uh, Sakura Press in Pennsylvania uh, gave me a shot. It's interesting what you just said, that in your 20s, you were copying other people, mm -hmm. but in your 30s, you felt, I guess, confident enough to use your own voice. Uh, beyond, do you think it was just about maturity? I had to grow up a lot, yeah. yeah. The, the early poems were, hey, look how clever this is. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they were, or at least my friends pretended they were. Yeah. Uh, after a while, I started writing about other people, and that's, I think, when they, they got better. And as with anything, the more I did it, the more confident I got, uh, and more relaxed. And you're not, you're not trying to show off, you're just trying to, uh, hopefully, people enjoy the poems on whatever level they want to. It makes me think of that um, saying for great writers, show, don't tell. Yes, that's a, that's those are three words that should be up in every writing school in the world. Mm -hmm. Because once you experience something, you don't have to, like, say, a diagram, this is what. You know, there's something about poetry, because um, th there are moments when I feel kind of ashamed that um, when I was in school, I didn't learn uh, about Shakespeare. You are not uh, alone. <laughs> Lil Byron or Dante or anything like that. Um, and I f it still feels like... Shakespeare, I mean, like, it's, it still kind of feels like poetry is inaccessible. So how do we make it more accessible to everyone? That's a good question. I, I, I hear that a lot, that, like, I don't like poetry. I hit it in school. That's what I, I did, too. I didn't really enjoy poetry until I left school. Mm -hmm. um, we teach it as a formulaic, boring, pedantic exercise when it's anything but. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shakespeare and the Bible are unfilmable, X-rated stuff. You couldn't get on TV or the movies now, and yet we teach them as boring, staid subjects. So we do the same to Plato. Um, he might be the most interesting writer who ever lived, and yet now he's a boring textbook writer that you're forced to read in first year or, or whatever. We're going to have to find ways to get teachers to bring this to students as, as part of their lives. It's fascinating stuff if it's taught properly. I mean, I think there is something to be said about maintaining tradition. Mm -hmm. um, your poems uh, demonstrate a reverence for a traditional form of poetry. Is that intentional? Oh, yes, yeah, very much. Mm -hmm. I hope, uh, if I'm doing my job really well, I, I hope to remind people of, say, Robert Frost or on. Uh, um, if they like, to, if they read the King James Bible, I hope they, they reminds me of that too. I, I have a real reverence for people who got it right, and, and hopefully I do too sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I do find that now on social media, people express themselves through poetry mm -hmm. that might not be seen as traditional. Like on Instagram, there's a young woman called uh, Alex L, mm -hmm. and I think she's terrific. Mm -hmm. And I think back before social media, I don't think she'll be able to uh, express herself through the poems. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a way for us to draw from the past and maybe uh, relay that poetry in the present? Oh, sure. I, every good poet remakes the makes the world in, in his or her own image, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, every great writer started out as a heresy, uh, and then they make the world into what they want it to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we think of uh, you know, say T.S. Eliot is boring and something you have to read in school, but at the time he was considered really out there, a modernist, untouchable. Mm -hmm. The same as Philip Larkin and a bunch of other poets. So the poets today who are using social media to get their work out there are doing exactly what they're supposed to. Get your work out there so readers can appreciate it mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and deal with it. The poet always has to have contact with the reader and vice versa. Mm -hmm. it's, you can cut this out too. As soon as government subsidies come in and publishers are publishing the stuff regardless of whether the public is interested or not, mm -hmm. that, that, that connection is cut. Mm -hmm. um, the, the poet who wants to be read will always want to interact with the public. And we're not cutting that out because that was great. <laughs> Let's talk about style because there is style in poetry. What would you say, uh, what stylistic and thematic choices have you made to align your work with classical poetry? I do my best uh, and, and when I fail it's a lack of uh, talent, not of effort. I do my best to remind people of poets I love, like Philip Larkin, who I just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, Yeats, Auden, Dante, Shakespeare. Obviously, I don't get to anywhere near their level. Uh, but I try to remind people of the poets that I read on my own. Uh, I find their, their stuff inexpressibly good, and that's the standard mm -hmm. I, I aim for. Uh, how does your work differ from the postmodernist and experimental poetry that we do see a lot today? Again, you'll probably be cutting this out later, but I, with some rare exceptions... We're not I, cutting anything out, Brian, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, 
you know, uh, starting uh, in the 20th century, some very gifted writers came along, like E.E. E. Cummings and James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, I could, we could both go on, mm -hmm. who in their brilliant way started breaking down the rules. And they could get away with it because of their enormous talent. Enormous talent. But the poet who comes along today and every line starts with I, and it's all in the lower case, and it's about their trip to Starbucks that morning and how the barista was rude, and that's the end. Or, and it doesn't rhyme, it doesn't scan. They're really talking to themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's like the, the modernist composer who will only write in a certain key in a dark room with no one listening. Mm -hmm. I think modernism went too far and divorced itself from the general public. And I can say a Joyce or a Stravinsky could get away with that sometimes, but... If people want to be read, I think their stuff should rhyme or scan because popular poetry sells enormously. Just ask uh, Drake or uh, Kanye West, uh, any pop band, you know, all their stuff rhymes and scans, mm. all of it. You're right. I know it, but I didn't know it until you said it. Um, in the in your uh, book, you write about different things. You mentioned barista. <laughs> There's actually a poem about barista. Um, and the theme of religion is woven through a few of the poems um, in your collection. For example, the poem Hollywood and Highland features mm -hmm. a street preacher. What were you trying to say there? Uh, hopefully, uh, I, what I was trying to get across there is how odd it was that... that uh, on that street that day, everyone was relieved that he wasn't panhandling and he wasn't uh, trying to coerce you into, you know, giving up money or having to... They, they like I said in the poem, they, were, they treated him like he was speaking Klingon, mm -hmm. like he was speaking a bygone language from a bygone day. And um, it's weird to me that a religion that took hold of a lot of Europe and much of the Americas and that has millions of adherents today in Los Angeles that day, he was a crazy weirdo. And there are crazy weirdos at Young and Dundas right now, as your producer was reminding me a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's weird how I would, a religion can take hold of, of, of many people, but as time goes by, it just becomes another way of, another ideology and people move on. Mm -hmm. um, even, um, the, I'm thinking back on some of the topics that you wrote in the book. There's a poem where you talk about a Hollywood uh, actress, because I think we still mm -hmm. live in a world very much where we place people, if you do this job, you're up here, mm -hmm. but then it turns out that that person is not the nicest person, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then again, you had one about this street preacher. Um, what were you trying to say in those poems by just using, I guess, I, I wouldn't say the Hollywood person is just an everyday person, but in California, they probably are. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to run into stars, hang around Beverly Hills for a while. Mm -hmm. That actually happened to an old boss of mine. She was at a Beverly Hills cafe, and uh, am I allowed to name the movie star, or does that spoil the segment? Oh, I, I do tell. Uh, <laughs> we might have to cut that part out, but okay. do tell. <laughs> Shirley MacLaine came roaring in, just as I describe it, used every F-bomb in the planet to get her lunch, and was just awful to everyone. Mm. And she's as bad as I describe it there. And my, my boss said, Brian, this is a, a brilliant poem, well done, but you've completely missed the point. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. What goes, point did you miss? She said, Brian, you don't understand. The staff there mostly found her charming. And I said, translation, she, they found her charming because she was rich and famous. And, and uh, it, I'm probably avoiding your question, but I, all I was trying to get across well, What do you was, think that says about us as a society? We worship these people beyond all reason. Mm. We're all like that. I'm guilty as charged. When I was a kid, I thought Guy Lafleur walked on water. Mm -hmm. um, we all worship celebrities far out of proportion to their merits. It's just part of how we're wired. And that that poem, I think I was just trying to show what happens to these people. They've been praised for so long. They've been called every good thing. They're, they're told they're the best. And once they stop getting the roles and once the fame starts, they, they're out of love for themselves or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that a few times. There's another poem about... Um, I'm out. Say the names. We'll decide my later. My wife and I had the pleasure of meeting Linda Blair once, and you can tell she's out of cash, out of money, out of ideas, and she used to be the biggest star in the world. Mm -hmm. They, I, I think, um, who was that guy on Parks and Rec uh, who's been famous? Rob Lowe. Mm -hmm. He said fame is the one drug you can't recover from. Because mm -hmm. uh, you want more and more of it. They don't ever recover, I don't yeah. think. I, I, I have known, yeah, it's just, it's something people can't, it can't help replacing their lives. 
If you could say in one line, we have about a minute left, but if you could, if someone's watching this and they're still not convinced uh, trying poetry, they feel as if it's something that's closed off to them and mm -hmm. they can't find anything about life in it, what would you say? I think, um, just to give another try, uh, uh, poetry, like I said, has been neglected for many reasons over the years. It's, it's modernism and the way it's taught in schools, but Great poets have a way of reaching down either through the centuries or from two minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, if their message is relevant to you, you'll find it. Uh, they can say things you won't find in any other art form. And we truly are just trying to get a better understanding of the world and our place in it. And mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed it. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much for your time. Thank you. Time travel is currently impossible, obviously, but that hasn't stopped people, especially in popular culture, from speculating about the problems it could cause. Serious people also think about it. For Brock University physics professor Barack Shoshani, doing the math might have helped find a way past one of the biggest barriers to time travel. Barack Shoshani joins us now to explain hi. Hello. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> you too. I, so I think it's safe to say that all of us have had that thought of, hmm, I wish I could go back to that day when I met that ex-boyfriend who ended up breaking up my heart after seven years. <laughs> I think I've said too much. <laughs> <laughs> but is time travel really possible in our universe? Well, you know, if I knew that, I would probably have a Nobel Prize by now. Um, all I can say is that, you know, it's it's something people are working on, but uh, it's probably gonna take hundreds of years to actually figure it out, if I'm being honest. Why do you think people are so um, fascinated with the possibility of maybe time travel existing or wanting it to exist? Well, those two things, right? So first of all, you would want to go back in time because you want to prevent yourself from meeting that ex-boyfriend <laughs> and so on. Uh, but also, you know, as a physicist, I'm really interested in just knowing how time works mm -hmm. and how causality works. And that's really the main uh, focus of my research. So, so that's why I'm so interested in this area. What are the two main arguments against the possibility of time, of, of time travel? So those, um, first of all, um, time travel paradoxes, the most famous of which are consistency paradoxes. Um, for example, the famous grandfather paradox, mm -hmm. where basically the time traveler goes back in time, kills the grandfather, or in a less violent version, just prevents the grandfather from meeting the grandmother, and then the parent is not born, and they are not born. But if they are not born, they cannot go back in time to do all that, so then they are born, and you get the paradox. Well, I think that reminds me of that movie, Back to the Future. Yeah. So how would you, if you were to give us a definition, what would the definition be of a consistency paradox? So it's when you go back in time and change something that will prevent you from going back in time. Mm -hmm. And therefore, of course, how could you change that thing if you couldn't go back in time? That is the, the essential uh, idea. Okay, you said there was, there's two main arguments. What's the other one? The other one is just, can you actually build a time machine? All right, so the first one is like, okay, if we build a time machine, there's gonna be paradoxes. What are we gonna do about that? Uh, but the second one is how do you even build a time machine in the first place? And uh, there are uh, many uh, obstacles to that. Uh, one of the main ones is that it seems like you would need something called exotic matter, which is matter with negative energy, which we don't really have available. We can get it in a very small amounts from quantum mechanical effects, but not in any sufficient amount to create a time machine. Well, how much would we need? Uh... The estimates vary between different papers in the literature, you know, from like uh, the, the entire energy of the universe to the energy equivalent of Jupiter. That's a lot of energy. It is a lot, and it's a lot of negative energy. Uh -huh. So say you did have that, um, then how would you create a time machine? Well, that's, uh, again, something we don't fully understand. Um, you know, in general relativity, um, we know that space-time can have curves and bends, and that is what we interpret as gravity. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we can curve space-time in just the right way, that it kind of curls back 
on itself in time, then we can loop back and create what we call, in the technical term, is a closed time-like curve, mm -hmm. which is just a loop where you go forward in the loop and eventually you end up in your own past. That is so cool. Kind of like this image, right? Like, yes. right? Um, <laughs> um, so you're working on this with your students and you, you've been working on time travel paradoxes for the last three years. What's your idea around resolving those paradoxes? So um, my papers, uh, I've had two papers published where I basically said the way that a lot of people think uh, to solve these paradoxes, which is called Novikov's self-consistency conjecture, is incorrect. Uh, or Why? Because, uh, so the Novikov conjecture basically says that if you go back in time, you can, you can go back in time, but you cannot change anything in the past. So you can't step on a bug, because yeah. otherwise it would destroy everything. In the exactly. Future. Or, you know, you try to kill your grandfather, but the gun jams and you can't do it mm -hmm. for some reason. And then you're not never born or something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. So then it prevents the paradoxes, because if you can't change anything, then you cannot prevent yourself from being born or from going into the time machine. Mm -hmm. Now, this, is, this sounds very good. The problem is that in my two papers, I presented time travel paradoxes that actually cannot be resolved in this way. So the, there is just, uh, they are kind of designed in a way that there cannot possibly be any consistent way to, uh, for the system to, to evolve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you talk about humans going back in time and, and clicking on, uh, you know, gun triggers, that's not something you can model mathematically. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we created these uh, time travel paradoxes using just particles moving around. And when you do that, you have a lot of control over what exactly happens. And you can make it so that there's no way that if, if you go back in time, you basically have to change the future. There's no way that everything can be consistent. Just the act of you going back has already changed. Yes. Okay. Um, how have th uh, theorists approached the issue of consistency paradoxes in the past? So um, one way was this Novikov's conjecture. There was uh, another suggestion by Stephen Hawking uh, called the Hawking chronology protection conjecture, which basically says time travel is just impossible because the universe wants to protect chronology. Mm -hmm. And uh, the basic idea is that you need to uh, try to prove. So, you, you know, you look at mathematical models of time machines and you try to find something about them that is inconsistent or unrealistic or unphysical. Like, for example, maybe you need some infinite amount of something, and of course that is impossible. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, what I'm most interested in, because I think that's kind of a boring way to solve it, uh, what I'm interested in is um, uh, called parallel timelines mm -hmm. or multiple histories. And what are those? So basically you go back in time and you arrive at a different timeline than the one you came from. Mm -hmm. Now you can change whatever you want in this new timeline it's not going to affect the original timeline you came from. So let's say you went back in time and you prevented your grandparents from meeting, then you are never born in this second timeline, but you were born in the first timeline and that's where you came from. So there's no inconsistency. You just created the new timeline or a new history of the universe, uh, but you didn't prevent yourself from actually being able to go back in time. Is this like a multiverse? Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, when, when you watch, because um, there's a, we seem to be really fascinated with this idea of time travel and also the idea of multiverses. Mm. When you watch these movies, um, what do you think Hollywood gets wrong about that? You know, it, it's funny because I I love time travel movies and you know TV series, books, and so on, but it, they never get it right. Mm. They always do some weird stuff. Uh, like, uh, you know, in, you mentioned Back to the Future. So, you know, Malty goes back in time and he prevents his parents from meeting. Mm -hmm. And then... His he, mom falls in love with him. Yeah, his Awkward. mom falls in love with him. <laughs> <laughs> and then he looks at the photo and then in the photo he sees himself fade away. So, like, that's a, that's a nice kind of a plot device, but uh -huh. it doesn't make any physical sense. Like, why would someone take a photo of just nothing? 
right, in this new timeline that he created. So, you know, they always do stuff like that, which is, can, I understand why, because it's like to tell the viewer what's happening, but mm -hmm. that's not what would actually happen in reality. Um, I, one of my favorite ones with the multiverse was the uh, Spider-Verse with Miles Morales, where they're in different universes, mm -hmm. and every five seconds, someone's coming from a different universe. Anyway, that's another <laughs> conversation for another day. Yeah. Um, what's next for your research? So, um, in the papers I mentioned before, uh, I showed that Novikov's conjecture is uh, not applicable to certain types of paradoxes, which means that you can't use it to resolve paradoxes. Uh, and I suggested that parallel timelines is the correct solution. And next, I'm currently working with one of my students on a way to actually make these parallel timelines work. Because, you know, you say that going back in time creates a new timeline, but where does this timeline come from? Right? That is the main problem that no one has been able to solve so far. Mm -hmm. So uh, with my student, we are using uh, the concept of the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is kind of like uh, a, a, another way to describe a multiverse, where basically every time you measure something, uh, and let's say it has two different outcomes, then that splits the universe into two different branches, one for each outcome. And this happens like trillions of times every second. Mm -hmm. So now we'll, what we did with, is we're using this formulation of quantum mechanics to actually describe these parallel timelines as the same branches of the universe described using this interpretation of quantum mechanics. I mean, I could listen to you talk all day. Um, what does it feel like when you connect with your students on this fascinating topic? You're really great uh, in interpreting this really complex stuff, by the way. Uh, how does it feel? It yeah. feels great, because you know I, I love science fiction, and my students also love science fiction. And you know it, it's really cool when you can just uh, try to solve a problem that, that appears in science fiction. It's not really part of real life right now, but it is part of a lot of the science fiction that we know and love. And so it's just really fascinating to work on it. And it could be part of our life um, in like uh, maybe, presently soon. Maybe, yes. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. This was really fascinating. Thanks for having me. And that is tonight's agenda in the summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Tomorrow, why planting trees isn't a simple solution for climate change. Hope to see you then. The agenda in the summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.